TRF receiver kit of the 1930s from France. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project, available in video and in written form, made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is welcome and appreciated. This radio was found in France, in the commune of Montmac. This is a tuned radio frequency set which means that there is no oscillator and there are no intermediate frequency transformers. By the way that the radio is built, it is reasonable to assume that it has been a kit to be assembled at home. There is no model name, no serial number, and the dial scale seems to be some standard product, appearing on other French radios of the early 1930s. This radio must have been serviced in 1946 due to an annotation on the power transformer. The chassis needs to be treated to stop the development of rust. Therefore, a careful dismantling of the radio is organized so that a reverse engineered schematic diagram can be drawn. The two RF coils appear to be factory made. There is only a minimal difference between the two. The dismantling process continues until the chassis is completely clean. Then, it is left soaking in vinegar for 24 hours. Then, it is rinsed, dried and painted with a product containing zinc. The variable capacitor is washed in the dishwasher then dried, properly greased and oiled. The power transformer is checked and one or more shorts are evident. Therefore it should be rewound or replaced with a new one. A new custom power transformer is ordered assuming the output voltages to be the same as other similar radios. When the transformer finally arrives, it is possible to start the rebuilding process. The chassis is particularly thick and it is difficult to solder on it, even with a relatively powerful soldering iron. Therefore, before putting other components, a sort of network of copper wire is soldered to prepare the chassis ground soldering points that are necessary. The chassis is slowly populated again, because the power transformer takes a lot of space. Only the larger electrolytic capacitor can is mounted on top again, however remaining off circuit. The radio didn't have any tag strip and, in fact, some components were joined together without a stable soldering point. With the intention of keeping the original look instead of a regular tag strip, Something is made up with a piece of wood and some anchor screws. The remaining components are installed, keeping most of the old resistors, but changing all the capacitors. However, the spaghetti result is not what was planned. To cope with the initial voltage surge, the new filter capacitors are obtained by putting a couple in series which otherwise have individually only a working voltage of 400 volts. The loudspeaker has been laying facing up for decades. While testing the radio, it appears that it has been collecting so much dust that the voice coil cannot move. Opening the loudspeaker becomes necessary to remove all the dust. Unfortunately, there is also rust to take care of to avoid scratching the voice coil while functioning.
remounting the loudspeaker is not so straightforward. The hot glue is used only to keep in place the pieces of iron that otherwise would get attracted by the central core. If necessary, the hot glue could be remelted using a hot air gun. While remounting the cone, it is essential to verify the correct alignment so that the voice coil could not touch anything while functioning. Before trying the radio, some fuses are added to protect various parts of it. In practice, beside a main input fuse, all transformer outputs are protected by a specific fuse. Nowadays, nobody would want to take the chance to damage fairly rare antique vacuum tubes. There is also an issue regarding the transformer output voltages. The high voltage before the rectifier is slightly higher than what the rectifier tube would allow. To solve the problem, two extra resistors are added to cause a voltage drop before the plates. This solution is not appearing on the final schematics because it depends only on the power transformer specifications and the mains voltage fluctuation. Ordering an output voltage of 340 plus 340 volts would have been wiser. Also the antenna connection is changed slightly. There is no more the possibility to make a connection to the mains. Only the first antenna input is maintained while the second one becomes a ground connection. Both antenna inputs are also isolated by a capacitor, at least in this first revision. This is the full final schematic diagram of the first revision. On this radio, only the trimmers on top of the tuning capacitor allow to make a basic alignment. Nothing else, neither the coils, can be adjusted. To make the two parts of the main variable capacitor tracking together, the external blades of the capacitor could be bent, which has been done already originally. 
to avoid damaging the variable capacitor only a simple alignment is done with the trimmer capacitors tuning to a frequency in the medium wave band and trying to get the maximum output signal consequently the long wave band could not be aligned the radio works but it is not sensitive enough and all the usual noise that today's appliances produce significantly affects its ability to receive in this first revision only with an antenna preamplifier it is possible to catch some signal this radio was made originally without a dial glass and without a back panel a piece of plexiglass is added to avoid getting in touch with the chassis from the dial face. A back panel is made using a cheap raw panel or hardboard panel. This radio came without knobs, left side of the picture. But, observing other factory radios made with the same type of dial scale and dial frame, it is reasonable to guess what they might have looked like. On the right side appears a Rewa radio, unknown model with its original knobs. At the moment, only some common knobs are mounted until a better option is available. Here is how the radio works at this point with the help of an antenna preamplifier. Three years later, the radio is checked again to see if there can be a way to get a slightly better reception. First of all, the voltages are checked, noticing a significant fluctuation, depending on the position of the volume control, which affects the current drawn by the first tube, the RF amplifier. But please, notice that there may be inaccuracies on this map due to the fact that the measurements have not been taken simultaneously. A thought is given to the possibility of converting the set to 6.3 volts filament tubes of the same period of time, with the intention of making it easier to replace them in case of future failures. That would also allow replacing the power transformer with another one of a more suitable size for this small radio. In the meantime, coincidentally, the power transformer of an important piece of equipment fails, and the one used for this radio would be just perfect for the replacement. Therefore, the decision is taken. The piece of equipment is repaired using the power transformer donated by this radio, and a new electrical plan for the radio is made. As a starting point, the schematic diagram of the Pacific Radio Model 20, year 1937, is used for reference. Here it appears redrawn in a more intuitive way, ignoring the filament power supply. Compared to the original arrangement of the radio that is to be electrically redesigned, this model has a fixed bias for the final amplifier and the detector tubes, 
which allows to put the cathodes to ground avoiding the need for bypass capacitors. However, the new design will still rely on a power transformer, and all the tubes except for the rectifier will share the same filament voltage. Here is the initial new schematic diagram without most of the resistor values, which have to be determined experimentally. Initially, the expected bias at the control grid of the 6C6 should be about minus 3 volts, while at the control grid of the tube type 42 should be about minus 16 volts. It is then time to start over again, beginning with dismantling the previous spaghetti job under the chassis. It is interesting to observe that the capacitor can that was left there sealed with hot glue is leaking out some liquid anyway. When the chassis is clear again, instead of drilling new holes for the new power transformer, four short standoffs are soldered on the chassis for holding it. The chosen new power transformer is a Saxon work logger number GR3755-33, which, for the rectifier 2, has a 4 volts output winding. Luckily, this is the most external winding and it can be extended to obtain the 5 volts needed by the tube type 80 without removing the laminates. Then, it is sprayed with clear lacquer to make sure that the wire loops scratched in the process of inserting the copper through the narrow space close to the laminates. Do not move and have enough insulation. Like in other recent projects of this series, two fuses are put before the mains input and three sockets for halogen light bulbs are also prepared to control the input current to the power transformer with the function of dropping some voltage and of avoiding excessive current draw in case of shorts or component failures. However, this time, also another halogen light bulb is inserted in series with the B-plus line, right after the rectifier tube. It is a 20 watts, 230 volts light bulb, which could allow a maximum of 87 milliamps, or it would blow like a fuse if more current were drawn. This time, the old filter capacitor can that was dripping some liquid is cleaned from its guts and then refilled, using the capacitors in series already installed previously. With current arrangement, the negative side of the first capacitor would not be connected to the chassis. Therefore, it is important to keep the two negative leads separated and distinguishable, also using wires with different colors. This time, to avoid repeating the same spaghetti experience of the previous job, and to allow an easy replacement of components, because most values of resistors are yet to be determined, two boards are planned. They are made using nowadays standard parts. The reconstruction after the power supply starts from the RF tuning and amplification stage. Initially, instead of the field coil and of the output transformer, equivalent dummy loads are temporarily used. Especially for the purpose of determining the correct value for resistors, it is important to be able to observe some voltages simultaneously. When using more than a couple of voltmeters on a circuit containing high voltages, the usual test leads could be difficult and even dangerous to manage. Also, the excessive length of the lead wires could become an issue for safety concerns. To make things easier, some cheap auto multimeters have been adapted with fixed short leads using either small hook or alligator clips.
Also choosing random different colors for the wires could be beneficial. It is important to be able to measure the impedance of the set composed by the output transformer and the corresponding loudspeaker. It is sufficient to feed a 1 kHz signal of about 10 to 20 volts peak to peak to a resistor in series with the primary winding of the transformer, which however must be connected to the loudspeaker on the secondary winding. Reading the voltage across the resistors allows to calculate the current that is passing through the primary winding. Knowing the current and measuring the voltage across the primary winding, it is possible to calculate the impedance. For obvious reasons, it is advisable to use a resistor with a value that is close to the expected impedance, or at least of the same magnitude. Here is how a multimeter could be connected using a deviator switch, so that it can be used for measuring DC resistance and voltage across the two components. This clip shows the measurement of the impedance of the output transformer and loudspeaker of the radio starting from the DC resistance. Then the signal of 1 kHz, 20 volts peak to peak is applied and the voltages can be read. The calculation shows an impedance of about 3.5 kilo ohms, which is the half of what the tube type 42, but also the original tube type 47 would need. However, this is what was used originally and it is kept as it is. The loudspeaker is still okay, but the paper cone is very fragile and might not last long as it is. This time it seems more appropriate to treat it with a glue that would remain elastic once cured. The original radio had two 10 kilo ohms resistors in parallel with the field coil presumably to reduce slightly the current passing through it and also to reduce the voltage drop. The same configuration is kept in current arrangement, otherwise the voltage fluctuation would be too wide, depending on the position of the volume potentiometer, but also because the field coil could be incapable of standing the full current. Initially, the same resistors used for the first restoration were used again. I remember that I bought them at a local electronic shop, so I was very confident in their circumstances and I used them without testing their value. However, this time I am using various multimeters simultaneously, and it appeared that there was no perceivable voltage drop across the field coil. Was there a short? No, there was just a mistake in reading the resistor values. They were two 10 ohms resistors. So three years ago, the loudspeaker was operating mostly on residual magnetism. So embarrassing.
In this new arrangement of the radio, initially capacitor C10 was connected between the anode of the final amplifier and the chassis ground like in the Pacific Radio Model 20, already mentioned. For extra safety, a ceramic capacitor rated 1 kV was used. But it failed, all of a sudden turning into a resistor of less than 700 ohms. Luckily, the halogen light bulb put in series with the B-plus line saved the field coil and the output transformer. Later, the capacitor C10 was connected differently, using a component rated for 2 kV and a lower capacitance value. Even though the tubes type 6D6 and 6C6 are shielded internally, shielding them externally improved slightly the reception by reducing the tendency to oscillate. Unfortunately, the shield bases were not available, so some kitchen aluminum foil did the job, connecting it to the chassis. This is the final schematic diagram for the new electrical arrangement of the radio, including all the measured voltages, with maximum and minimum volume. The values on a blue background have been measured with a VTVM. This video comes along with some written documentation that contains a better detailed picture of the schematics. With this new arrangement, the chassis is meant to be connected to the external electrical ground, and the antenna ground is no longer isolated from the chassis. To facilitate the alignment, a small 5 picofarads capacitor was added in parallel to the first section of the variable capacitor. The radio arrived without knobs. This time it seemed appropriate to make some simple wooden knobs instead of adapting something else that would not be period appropriate. And here is the result. The radio is connected to an indoor wire antenna of about 10 meters. The test is done at night, when the long wave and medium wave signals are stronger. The volume control is generally kept at the maximum possible level. The test starts with the long wave band. The radio was aligned for the medium wave band, therefore for this band the radio does not perform well. Student był przed 
przetrzymywany w areszcie przez dwa miesiące. Na początku nie wiadomo było, w którym więzieniu przebywał. Medium wave band.